Today we'll be talking about contracts made prior to marriage. Premarital agreements, commonly referred to as prenups, have become more and more common over the years. Premarital agreements have not been widely favored for several reasons. First, premarital agreements were viewed as an easy exit out of a marriage. Let's say that Joe and Debbie execute a premarital agreement that states that Debbie will receive $1,500 per month in spousal support until the time she remarries, as long as her marriage to Joe lasts at least five years. If after five years Joe and Debbie have problems, Debbie could walk away from the marriage with $1,500 per month rather than choosing to work on her marriage. Unlike traditional contracts, Premarital agreements generally benefit one partner over the other. In the previous example, Debbie is the clear beneficiary of the agreement with Joe, unless of course there is a significant change in income since the time of the execution of the agreement. Joe would be more inclined to work on the marriage as he would have financial consequences for getting divorced. There was also the view that premarital agreements focused more on a business-like relationship than a loving relationship. Because of all of these considerations, courts generally disfavored premarital agreements. The case of Posner v. Posner changed all of this. In this case, the husband and wife agreed that upon a divorce, the wife would receive $600 per month in spousal support. At the time of their divorce, the husband's net worth was approximately $16 million. The court found that the wife was aware of the consequences of entering into such an agreement and that because the divorce was sought for a reasonable cause, that the agreement was valid. What does it take to create a valid premarital agreement? This type of contract requires an offer and acceptance, just like any other contract. In the case of prenups, this is generally shown through the signatures of each party. A premarital agreement must also contain some type of consideration. In the case of Joe and Debbie, the consideration is a monthly spousal support payment of $1,500 if the marriage lasts for five years or more. Third, both parties must have capacity to enter into the agreement. This means that both must understand the consequences of entering into the agreement and be of age to enter into a contract. A prenuptial agreement entered into by a minor is invalid. Finally, the premarital agreement must not contain an illegal subject matter. If Joe and Debbie's premarital agreement stated that Debbie would only receive spousal support if she participated in an insurance fraud scheme, it would be invalid. Even if the courts determine that a premarital agreement is valid, there's also a test of fairness. Courts look to both the time of the execution of the agreement as well as the time of the performance. Regarding the formation of the agreement, courts will review the terms of the prenup to determine if both parties fully disclosed all their assets at the time of the execution. Each party should also have the opportunity to review the agreement with an attorney. It is not required that an attorney actually review the agreement, but each party must be able to do so if they choose. Finally, the court wants to be sure that each party freely and voluntarily entered into the premarital agreement. This means that neither party can be forced or pressured into the agreement. Debbie can't say to Joe, if you don't sign this prenup, the wedding's off. In the case of Joe and Debbie, $1,500 per month may seem to be a fair and reasonable amount. If, however, Debbie stayed home to manage the house while Joe grew an extremely successful business, then the agreement may not be as fair at the time it is performed. Likewise, if the financial status of the couple greatly declined, $1,500 per month may be greater than Joe can afford. What are permissible subjects for premarital agreements? Common areas of premarital agreements that have been upheld include property and spousal support. In the case of property agreements, it is important to understand what property is non-marital 
versus marital property, which is subject to division upon divorce. Most property agreements are upheld to be valid. With regard to spousal support, a waiver of support is closely examined as courts do not want one spouse to become dependent upon public assistance after a divorce if the former spouse can provide assistance. Child custody and child support are not included in premarital agreements for several reasons. One, a prenup cannot anticipate the needs of a child who is not yet born. Second, the state has an interest in the care and custody of children. A prenup that waives an obligation for support places support obligations on one parent alone, unless that parent receives help from the state.